Okay, folks, it's time to get started. A couple of reminders in case you need them. The first is that uh, you want feedback on evaluation, try to get it in to me by Friday. I won't even set a time, sometime Friday, midnight Friday. It spills over Saturday, send it Saturday. This is not some hard deadline. I'd prefer to get it out of my way this weekend. So that's why I want it at the start of the weekend. because next Monday, you have something else on your plate, right? We haven't even checked your calendars, have you? Okay. There's no rest for the wicked, so next Monday is your second quiz, in case you haven't checked. I will send this email out this, e this evening with uh, second quiz review and past quizzes in case. No, but you need to be able, you can do both at the same time. Think of your evaluation as part preparation for your quiz and it'll make it a little easier. So just those two things. Finally, I've been checking the master list. There are a few of you still haven't either picked a company or told me the company you pick. Try to remedy that. Put the company in so that I want all 350 of you with companies next to your names. Okay. So let's talk about where we left off in valuation. We valued 3M, we valued Con Ed, we valued the S&P 500. And we started in the valuation of Amazon, and that's where I'm going to continue. But before I do that, let's do a couple of questions about valuation. And they can relate to what you're doing in your, in your valuation. Here's the first one. Okay. So when you value a company, unless you have a very odd valuation, you're going to come up with a value different from the price, right? Every, if those of you have finished your valuation agree with this, your value is going to be different from the price. Some of you it's lower, some of you it's going to be higher. So I'm going to read a few statements about how you would characterize this, and you're going to give away a lot more than you intend to by which, which answer you pick. The first is that you are right and the market is wrong. How many of you think that that is the best explanation? Good, because that was the case. You've got an ego problem that's so big that I don't even know where to start, right? How about you are wrong and the market is right? Be honest. Many of you are starting with that presumption, right? And you know how this is going to manifest itself, which is you tweak numbers. You push up your growth rate, you lower your discount rate, you play a little with this, and the value moves closer, and you feel so much more comfortable. Don't, don't, don't take it as personally. This is how it is when you first start to do valuation. It's safest to be close to the market, because then if you screw up, you always have lots of company. The truth, though, is that you're pro both wrong. Why? Because the market is, I mean, think of it as a Yelp review of a restaurant versus your own review of a restaurant. Yelp review is not perfect. I've gone to restaurants with five-star reviews and said, who ate at this restaurant? This is the crappiest food I've ever eaten. You can't account for people's taste. Same thing is true for markets. Markets make mistakes. You make mistakes. You're saying, what the heck do we do with this? You just have to hope that your mistake is smaller than the market's mistake. You're both wrong. You just hope you're less wrong. Obviously, you both can't be right. Two numbers can't coexist and claim to be the value at the same time. And maybe it's none of the above, in which case I'm, I'm completely befuddled as to what exactly none of the above would even mean. So the reality is you're both wrong. And today we're going to talk about what that means. What does it mean when you're wrong and you're okay being wrong? Second. No, some of you are valuing young companies. Okay. Anybody want to be a volunteer? How many, who's valuing young companies here? Come on, one in five. You're valuing a young company. In fact, you're valuing such a young company, it doesn't even have revenues. It takes a lot of courage to pick a company like that, right? So what do your cash flows look like even in your most optimistic scenarios next year, two years out, three years out? That's a... In your optimistic scenario, zero. In the most realistic scenarios, they're going to be big negative numbers because the company, in fact, for most of you valuing on companies, your cash flows are negative in year one, year two, year three, et cetera, right? So what? Let's say you have negative cash flows of a minus a billion in year one. 
what are you implicitly, implicitly assuming your company is going to be able to do in year one? Because remember, you have year one, year two, year three, and you get nirvana, which is what the terminal value. To get to nirvana, what are you assuming your company will be able to do in year one with a negative cash flow of a minus value? What do you think it's going to be? You have no clue. Minus a billion negative free cash flow. Just a number on the spreadsheet, but there has to be an implicit assumption you're making. No, no, but first you got to get over the minus a billion. That minus is scaring. You got to come up with fresh capital in year one to cover the minus a billion. You're implicitly assuming they're going to be able to raise that capital. Have you told me from where? But you did your cost of capital, you gave me weights for debt and equity. So you said 90% equity, 10% debt. So you think 90% of that billion has to come from issuing new shares. 10% might be from debt. Just saying, so what? You raise 900 million new shares. What's going to happen to your share count next year? It's going to go up. And then if you have negative cash flows in year two, it's going to go up more. And here's the puzzle. When I do the value of your young company, if you look at my spreadsheet, I take your cash flows, I discount them back, I come up with the value of equity today. And what do you divide that value of equity by? The number of shares outstanding today. This seems like I'm missing something, right? Because if this company has to issue new shares in the future, the share count is going to go up. So why am I not counting the extra shares in the share count today, knowing, because I know, I can see in your cash flows, you have to issue new shares. It seems like I'm being deliberately blind to those share issuances. Anybody want to give a shot at why I'm not counting those additional shares? Or am I just screwing up? That could all, always be a possibility. Why am I not counting the extra shares? What does this negative cash flow do, do to your value of equity today? See, let's say you have negative cash flows in year one, year two, year three, year four. When you take the present value of those cash flows, you lower the value of your equity today by two billion, two and a half billion, three billion, right? You're effectively already, that's the dilution effect. You're already counting it in the value. If I divide that number by a share count that includes the shares I will issue to cover those negative cash flows, I'm actually double counting. Lower present value because I have negative cash flows, higher share count for the same reason, I'm double counting. I'm going to undervalue the company. It makes my life a lot simpler to do what I'm doing, which is to ignore the share issuances and count the effect of the delusion in the present value. You no, know, it sounds abstract, but when I do my Amazon valuation, I'll actually quantify how much of that dilution effect already is in my value and why I don't need to count the extra shares. So with that lead in, let's go back to the Amazon page, which is where we left off last session. I think we're page 286. So remember my valuation of Amazon? I, you know, I, I dug the company out of the ground. Small money losing company. I made it a big money making company. I allowed for the growth by putting in a reinvestment based on the sales to capital ratio. But I didn't quite complete the entire process. So if you project out what my revenues are going to be, I use the compounded revenue growth of 42% to make my revenues go from a billion to 41 billion. Today, I'll talk about why I use 42% as my growth rate and why 41 billion as my end revenues. I made the losses become profit. Then I'll talk about how I'm getting the margins in the intermediate years, but I start with minus 36.7. I end up at plus 10. And for the reinvestment, I use the sales to capital ratio. And this is actually the first valuation where I concocted, concocted a sales to capital ratio. And it was after struggling with every other approach I'd ever been taught in estimating reinvestment. Take a look at my free cash flows. And this is an upbeat story of a company that's going to increase revenues 40 fold, improve its margins. If you look at my free cash for the firm, minus 931 million in year one. Minus 1 billion in year two, minus 989 million in year three. In fact, my cash flows for the first six years are all negative, which means implicitly, I'm assuming that Amazon will raise capital primarily from equity because I'm using but 99% equity, 1% debt for the next six years. I've got my cash flows. What do I need to complete the valuation? I need costs of capital. 
Notice the word, I, I use the, the word plural because cost, one, there can't be one cost of capital because the company's changing too much over the next 10 years. I start with a cost of capital of 12.84% when Amazon is a young money losing company. But as you go through time, take a look at what's happening to my cost of capital. As the company becomes larger and more money making, the cost of capital decreases to 9.61%. That's what you should expect to see with young companies, cost of capital starting high, going to much lower now. I'm almost home. I'd have to take the cash flows and discount them back at the cost of capital. So I'm gonna do something incredibly simplistic, but hang in there anyway, right? So I take year one, discount back one year, year two, discount back two years. Now, normally the way you discount is you take the cash flow and divide by one plus the discount rate raised to the power of five, six, seven. Don't do that. When your cost of capital are changing, you got to keep track of what's called accumulated cost of capital. And let me explain. If you take your sevens cash flow, which I think is 177 million, you can't discount it back seven years at 11.62%. You got to take 1.1284 and take the product of those costs of capital because your costs of capital are changing over time. You take those present values and the elephant in the room, of course, is the terminal value of 52 billion. What do you get as a present value is 15.17 billion. You add cash, almost nothing. Subtract debt, almost nothing. You get a value for equity of 14.8 billion. You're ready to divide by the number of shares, right? But before you do it, you have to stop and make sure those options you've been giving away haven't eaten away too much of your value. If during the option section, you wondered why are we wasting our time? How much difference can it make? Take a look at how much of Amazon's equity has been given away in the previous five or six years as options to employees, $2.9 billion. That was almost 20% of the value has been given away. Why? Because accountants keep kept telling them it's free, doesn't matter. And they took that to heart, gave away a fifth of the company. You divide by the number of shares outstanding, the value per share, again, is $35 and eight cents. Forget the eight cents, $35. Is this an upbeat story that I'm telling? Revenues go from a billion to 41 billion. Margins go from a big negative number to a big positive number. They're reinvesting incredibly efficiently. And in spite of telling the upbeat story, the value that I'm getting is only $35, as opposed to what? The stock was actually trading at $84. Look at the start of this class. I said the whole point of valuing companies is you need to be willing to act on those valuations. I've tried my best to stay true to that. I mean, half, maybe two thirds of my portfolio is composed of companies I've been trapped into buying. In what way? I value a company, the value is higher than the price. Somebody in the audience says, would you buy the stock? I can say no, in which case I've lost that person for the rest of the session because I say, if you can't, you're not going to buy the stock, what's the point? I can say no and lie, you have no way of checking, you know, yeah? or yes and buy, yeah? and I get trapped, I buy. So if something is undervalued, I'm fairly willing to jump in and buy that stock. Here, I've come up with a company that is overvalued. Obviously, you're not asking me, am I buying? What's the analogous question you would ask me here? Am I shorting? It's exactly the question I got asked at the end of this valuation. And I said, not in this lifetime. The natural response I got is, don't you feel confident enough in your value to do it? I said, I feel more confident that Amazon is overvalued in January 2000 then I felt about any company that I bought that was undervalued. It's not a confidence issue. So here's my generic question. Why, when something is undervalued, am I willing to step in and buy? But when something is overvalued, I'm not as eager, at least in January 2000, to step in and sell short. What's the difference? What do you need to make money? Remind me again. After you bought this, what has to happen? The price has to adjust to value. When I buy something, I control my time horizon. You know why I control my time horizon? I'm not a portfolio manager. I don't have clients to answer to. I have my spouse to answer to, but I turned off statements to paperless a long time ago. She doesn't even know what's in our portfolio. I'm willing to wait as long as it takes, and I can wait. Whereas when you sell short, what exactly are you doing? Does it, can anybody tell me what, what selling short is? You're borrowing the shares 
and agreeing to return them if you're asked for those shares back. So I knew this question was coming. You could see it coming a mile away. So before I did the session, I called around to see how long a broker would give on a short sale before they would ask for the shares back. Peak of the dot-com boom. The demand for the shares was incredibly high. The longest I could get, and this was from a broker who really liked me, was six weeks. He said, I could give you six weeks, but that's because you're a good customer. Now do you see why I said not in my lifetime? Not only do I have to feel confident that I've got the value right, but I have to feel confident that the adjustment will happen in the next six weeks. And that's one of the great asymmetries in investing. When something is undervalued, there is a bargain basement strategy, is buy and hold. When something is overvalued, it's difficult to find an equivalent long-term strategy that you can use to take advantage of their overvaluation. You know what the, the implication of this is, right? You're not going to get too many downside bubbles. You're going to get a lot more upside bubbles because you have an upside bubble. All you can do is look and wonder and say, that's really overpriced. Remember the peak of the housing bubble? Let's say you knew it was a bubble. What were you going to do? Sell short your neighbor's house? I sold your house. It's not my house, but I'll return it to you in 30 years. It doesn't work that way. So the problem with bubbles when you cannot have a strategy to sell short is bubbles are going to get bigger. Eventually, they'll all burst, but you can't take advantage of them as quickly, which allows them to get as big as they do. So I want to talk about this valuation, but I want you to remember that because many of you will find your companies to be overvalued. And I'm gonna ask you to buy or sell, but selling short requires not, it's just not, it's not a question of confidence, being able to get enough of a time horizon where even if you're right, you're able to make money. So let's look at some of the lessons you can extract from this valuation. Remember when you talked about betas, I said, don't trust betas. And lots of standard error, the backward looking. That goes in spades when you look at the beta for a young company. In January 2000, Amazon was a young company. I pulled up the Bloomberg beta page. And you can, if you want, you can compare the beta page then to the beta page now. There was the regression beta, 2.23. You're saying, this is good, I have a regression beta. Take a look at the second to last item in that box. Say standard error of the beta, 0.50. So let me put this up. The regression beta is 2.2. The standard error is 0.5. See the range you're going to get on the beta? It's somewhere between 1.2 and 3.2. Fat lot of good that does you when valuing Amazon. With young companies, regression beta has become incredibly noisy. So even if you are attached to using regression beta for mature companies, don't do it for young companies. Think, what's the choice? What do we do as a counter to regression beta? We said, estimate a bottom-up beta. And for Amazon, I, I'm sorry, for Amazon in 2000, I estimated two bottom-up betas. For the first five years, I used the beta for online retailers as my beta for the company. Why? Because young re online retail company, money-losing company, I said, that's probably better reflective of where they are as a company. Once you get to year five, well, I'm giving this company $15 billion in revenues. It's a large retail company, so... Starting in year five, I moved that beta towards a beta for all retail companies. That's why you saw my cost of equity shift as much as it did. But again, you're sticking with bottom-up betas rather than going with the regression beta. Second, I'm going to give away the secret sauce. You know what, what chef said, don't come into the kitchen. You want to see how I'm making the meal. I'm going to take you into the kitchen so you can see where the 42% compounded revenue growth comes from. So there's no mystery here. When I first sat down to value Amazon, I did it the way I was taught to do valuation, which is to go sequential. You know what that means? Do your one, then do your two, then do you. And I discovered very quickly it was driving me crazy. It's too much uncertainty. I had no idea what year two would look like, year three would look like. By the time I got to year four, I was completely lost. I said, this isn't working. So I tried a different game and it's a game that I still go back to whenever I look at young companies. I said, rather than try to estimate what year one and year two and year three will bring, I'm going to think of what a successful Amazon will look like to me. That's a story part. 
And in 2000, I actually liked Amazon as a company. I liked the way it was run. I liked the way Jeff Bezos had set out a strategic direction for the company. I thought it would succeed, but I had no idea what success would look like. So here's what I did. I downloaded data in every retail company because I wanted to get a sense of what does big revenue look like for a retail company. The largest retail company in 2000 was Walmart with 180 billion in revenues. The first question I asked was, if Amazon succeeds, will it look like Walmart? And in 2000, my answer was, I don't think so. It's not a discount retailer, it wants a better margin. So I said, it's not gonna be 180 billion. I looked at the gap, which had 18 billion in revenue. So I said, if Amazon succeeds, would look like the gap. And I said, it's gonna be bigger than the gap. It's not just apparel, it sells other stuff because by 2000, it had already made this transition from online book retailer to online retailer of pretty much everything. Almost by trial and error, going back and forth, I ended up around the sixth largest retailer in the world. So if Amazon succeeds, it's going to be about as big as the sixth largest retailer. And guess how much revenue the sixth largest retailer in the world had? About $40 billion. So I know where I am. I know where I'd like to get. And you say, how do you come up with those revenue growth rates in year one, two, three? I made them up. You didn't mishear me. I made them up. And if you made a really big deal about year one and say, you know what? I think the revenue growth rate is going to be 163.33%. You can have it. You want year two? Take it too. If you give me the final number, the end number, I control the valuation. You know, when you get the FCFF Ginzu spreadsheet, I ask you for a revenue growth rate. The growth rate is not the end game. It's what you get as revenues in your tent that you should keep your eye on. It, that, that, that's driving the valuation. So you can play with the growth rate in your one and years two through five, but keep your eyes on the price, which is what will the revenues look like as a mature company? Because that's where your story is headed. That's why when young companies report their first earnings reports and people free card earnings per share is two cents worse than expected. I mean, the analogy I can think of is when you have a kid and the kid goes off to kindergarten and comes back with a kindergarten report card and you look at the report card and say, you're never going to college. You may be overreacting, don't you think? What did you see in that report card? No. But that's basically how when people react to early earnings reports, you feel like, what are you reacting to? It's the end game that drives the valuation focus on the long term. So that's the revenue part. So any questions on, so that's where the 42% came from. It's from trying to get to 400 billion, I'm sorry, to 40 billion in revenues. That gives you about a 42%. In fact, let me pause there. Could I have told a bigger story for Amazon in 2000? Yes, you could have said, well, Amazon will be more like Walmart. And then what I would expect to see then is margins that are much lower to go with that because you're telling a discount retail story. So I'm not saying my story is right, but it's my story. It's going to drive my valuation. You can think of alternate stories which lead you to different end games. Yes. The only rule I followed, as I said, I made it up, is as I got bigger, I used to lower growth rate. So if you want to build in some mathematical function, I'll tell you it'll have very little effect on your final value. And that's why it's not worth finessing. The only rule is as you scale up, it's going to be get more and more difficult to get high growth rates. So make the growth rate decrease as you get bigger because delivering the same increase in revenues in year three will give you a lower growth rate than delivering it in year two. You're building off lower rates. Now let's talk about margins. I know my starting margin, right? It's given minus 36.7. I know my ending margin. How the heck did you come up with all these middle numbers? Looks like I'm incredibly prescient, right? Second decimal point, minus 13.35%. You must think I have some crystal ball in my basement. Say, please tell me what the mark. I'll give away a secret. What I had in my spreadsheet initially was 10 empty cells. And complete terror on having to fill in those cells, trying to estimate margins. Near. So... I turned my spreadsheet loose and said, please fill in the numbers. And it was actually very compliant, but I had to give it some direction. I gave it a very simple algorithm that actually filled out the cells. And I want you to try to guess what that algorithm was. Okay? What is it that's allowing me to go from minus 36 to minus 13.35 minus some? I'll give you a clue. It's got nothing to do with exponentials, logs. Don't think high level math. Think third grade math. 
How do you think I've come up with the, those numbers? Anybody want to try to, to figure them out? I'll give you a starting point. Where am I now? Minus 36.7. Where would I like to be at the end? 10. What's the distance between those two points? What is, I took half the distance. Half the distance brings me to minus 13.35. I'm now at minus 13.35. I want to get to plus 10. I take half the distance. That brings me to one point, minus one point. Saying why half? Why not? <laughs> I'll tell you, when I build spreadsheets, I want to design them in a way where if you disagree with my story, you can go in and change the numbers quickly. You know what the half does? It moves me towards my margin pretty quickly. It's a pathway to profitability. Let's say you agree with every other part of my Amazon valuation, but you think the pathway to profitability is going to be a lot more rocky for Amazon than I think it is. You know what you can do? Take the half and make it a quarter. So that's an input. If I do that, what happens? I move a quarter of the distance each year. I'm going to lose more money for a longer period before I turn the corner. You know, this input I've replaced in the spreadsheet because people got puzzled by it. Remember the converged year of convergence input I asked you for? You know what that's designed to do, right? If you are optimistic about your company being able to its move to its margin smoothly, you set a year of convergence that's sooner. You're going to get to your target margin in year four or five. I'm going to move you faster. If you set it to year 10, you're still going to get to the same target margin, but it's going to take you a lot longer to get there. You're going to lose more money before you get there. It's the easiest mechanism I could think of for fixing margins. So there's the secret. It looks precise, but it's based on this very simplistic algorithm. Again, if you made a big deal about margins in year one, and so I think it's going to be minus 15%, you can have it. You want year two, have that too. The end game is what's driving the valuation. So if you take the revenues, multiply them by the margins, you come up with expected operating income. Then I have after-tax EBIT. The first three years, I'm losing money. So my after-tax EBIT is the same as my pre-tax EBIT. In year four, I'm making money, but I seem to be paying no taxes. What am I doing that's protecting me from having to pay taxes in year four? I just keep track of how much money you've lost. And if you gave me a starting NOL, I add that to it. And in the years that I start to make money, I use your NOL to offset taxes. The simplest and cleanest way to deal with NOLs is to build them into your cash flows. In this case, I use the NOL in year four. I use part of it in year five. And in year six, I have no NOLs left. I go to your effective tax rate. That's why I ask you if you have a money losing company, do not give me an effective tax rate. I don't care. I'm not going to ask you to pay taxes. But eventually, I will push your tax rate towards what you tell me your tax rate is once you've run out of those NOLs. So there's my after tax operating. Hopefully this takes the mystery away. It looks like there are lots of assumptions, but it actually is three assumptions, revenue growth, margin, and the sales. And, and the next page, you're going to see the sales to capital ratio driving your numbers. Now I've had at least a half a dozen of you ask me why I stopped in year 10, partly because you're valuing young companies with a lot of promise and you want to go 15 years and 20 years. Mechanically, there's no reason why you can't go, right? You just extend the spreadsheet out. And I could tell you how to do it. I could actually do it for you if you need to. But before you start adding extra years, I'm going to show you a graph that should make you sober up before you start adding years. It's a graph that actually looks at IPOs and revenue growth at IPOs relative to the revenue growth of the sectors that these IPOs belong to. So let me start with the good news. When you track IPOs and you look at the revenue growth one year after the IPO, the revenue growth is 15% higher than the sector. You see, this is why I bought the IPO, they're much faster growing. You track the same IPOs two years after, the revenue growth is about 7% higher than the sector. Three years after, it's 3% higher than the sector. By the time you get to year five, you cannot tell the star company apart from the sector. You know what the lesson from this graph is? Growth fades fairly quickly at most companies. The median growth period for a growth company in the US is between three to five years. The 90th percentile of growth periods for growth companies is about 10 years. I've stopped there. Are there companies that have grown for longer than 10 years? Absolutely. 
You can name them, right? Apple, Microsoft. What does the fact that we can name these companies tell you about these companies? They're the exception, not the rule. And I think when we talked about terminal value, I said, be careful, because if you make your company an exceptional company right off the bat, where's your upside? You priced it to be the very best. So I stop at 10 years, not because I don't know that companies can grow for longer than 10 years, but because I feel from an intrinsic value standpoint that if you continue to grow after 10 years, it should be icing on the cake for me, not the cake itself. Because it's something I need to claim as an investor. Let's talk about reinvestment. I've given you the mechanics of reinvestment and you're using it in the spreadsheet, the sales to capital ratio. And that's good, right? Because you connect reinvestment to revenues, you kind of move on. So what I've done here is taken the revenues, taken the change in revenues every year and used the sales to capital ratio to get my reinvestment. So you take the change in revenues, 1.676 billion, you divide by three, you get 559 million. You do that every year. Two things to say about those mechanics. One is your sales to capital ratio doesn't have to be constant over time. In fact, I give you a shot in the spreadsheet to change it after year five if you feel that your company will become more efficient or less efficient in delivering growth. Second, that reinvestment you have also becomes the change in invested capital each year. This is always true in free cash flow evaluation is whatever you show as reinvestment becomes the delta in your invested capital. You're saying, so what? If you look at the bottom three lines of your evaluation output from your spreadsheet, here's what I do. I keep track of your after-tax operating income based on your growth and margins. I also keep track of what's happening to your invested capital over time using your reinvestment numbers added on to your starting reinvestment number. If this is going somewhere, hang in there with me. If I divide the after-tax operating income by the invested capital, I come up with a return in invested capital. You never used it directly in evaluation, but when you made assumptions about sales to capital and growth and margins, whether you like it or not, you are creating a return on capital. And here's what I'd like you to do. Take a look at your return on capital in your, your 10. And don't look at your return on capital now. It's a negative number. It's a young growth company. It's losing money. Take a look at it in your 10. I'll tell you what I did with Amazon. The return on capital I got in your 10 was 20.39%. And I was okay with that. Why was I okay with it? Remember, this was in 2000. The T-bond rate was 6.5%. Very different time. The average return on capital for retail companies was about 17%. And I felt that Amazon was special enough that it could earn a higher return on capital. What if this had been 200.39% instead of 20.39%? That would have been a number that I could not live with. Too high a number. If your return on capital in year 10 is too high, what is it telling you about how much you reinvested during the next 10 years? You didn't reinvest enough, right? And if you're listening, what should you do? Go back and lower your sales to capital ratio to get a return on capital you can live with. You're building a company with your assumptions and you got to be okay with the company you built. And one of the triggers you're going to look at is what kind of return on capital am I giving this company in your 10 based on my assumptions? So if you get a chance, go back and look at that return on capital you get in your 10 for your company and ask yourself, am I okay with that return on capital? We talked about dilution. Let me go back and fill in the gaps. When you have young companies, money losing companies, cash burning companies, companies with negative free cash flows, it is true that to cover those cash flows, you have to raise capital. Some of that cap capital is going to come from issuing equity. There's going to be a dilution of that. And you worry about, why am I not counting that dilution? You take the Amazon valuation. Let me go back and show you the cash flows. You take those cash flows. The value I got was 15.17 billion, right? But remember, that already incorporates the negative cash flows for the first six years. If I hadn't counted those negative cash flows, this number would have been eight, would have been about 18.2 billion. In effect, I'm lowering the value of Amazon by about 16%. Why? Because the company has negative cash flows. That's a dilution effect. I'm already bringing it into value. And because I'm already lowering the value by 16% for those negative cash flows, I'd be double counting if I then brought in the additional shares I'd be issuing to cover those negative cash flows into the denominator. Yes. Then you don't have then then the cash flows are positive 
And in fact, that's a good question to ask. When you have positive free cash flows to firm and you discount it, what are you effectively assuming the company is going to be doing each year? What's the discounting do? It's taking the cash out of the company, right? There's no cash buildup in the company because in a discounted cash flow valuation, everything gets extracted out of the company, either as cash flows to debt, interest and principal payments, or cash flows to equity. So positive free cash flows are easy to deal with, the cash leaving the company. Negative cash flows are more difficult because that has to be capital coming into the company and that can alter share count. But in the case of buybacks, the share count can actually decrease. And there again, you don't want to count that because that'd be double counting. You'd be counting the cash flows and lowering the share count at the same time. So when you do discounted cash flow valuation, don't worry about share count or changes in share count over time. The present value should already take care of it. When I valued Amazon in 2000, I make a confession. Those negative cash flows in year six, I assumed that the company would be able to raise the capital to keep going. Is that a safe assumption? Though? And what, now in the aftermath of Silicon Valley Bank collapsing, we had stories about how this might impact venture capital to young companies. Let's say you're a young company in Silicon Valley, lots of promise, but big negative cash flows in the next three years. But let's suppose venture capital dries up. What's going to happen? Go out near one, you can't raise the capital. What happens to a company? Even if every single forecast is right, the company is going to fail, right? It's going to be sold, liquidated. And in 2001, that's exactly what happened to dot com companies. In 2000, I did not have a failure rate in my spreadsheet, and it was a mistake. It was a mistake because I was missing the fact that young companies can fail. 2001, I learned my lesson. That's when failure rates first showed up in my spreadsheet because I said, if a company is unable to raise the cash flows, it is likely to fail. The problem with the failure rate is, if you ask me, how can I best estimate the failure rate? My answer is going to be kind of fuzzy. If your company has a rating, then I'm going to say use the rating because we have a history of ratings and what percentage of companies with each rating fail. So if you go to the failure rate worksheet in your spreadsheet, and there is a worksheet, you'll actually see, given the rating, what the likelihood of failure is by your tech. So that's one. But many young companies don't have ratings. So here are a couple of things that you want to factor in. This is actually from the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US. And this is actually one of the most interesting data sets that I discovered. They maintain this every year. It's free. Go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You can download it. Here's what they do. They track the number of companies that are starting up in each business, and they track what percentage of these companies make it through year one, make it through year two, make it through year three. Let's look at the, from this graph, what that, that statistic, this was from the 2007 study. In the next page, I'll give you the update. In 2007, for every 100 companies that got started, 80% made it through year one, 20% failed in year one. Look at year two but 66%. So from year one to year two, another 14% fail. Each year, the failure rate is getting lower. But by the time you get to year 10, for every 100 companies that got started, about 31 made it to year seven. What do we assume in that DCF evaluation? Cash flows in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year 10, right? If you have a young company already, you can see that if I took those cash flows, discounted the back and came up with the value, I'm getting the value for the 31% of the time. The company will make it, but the remaining 69%, what happens? The company fails, and then I've got to follow through. What happens when the company fails? It sells its assets. So if you look at right below the failure rate, I ask you, what happens if you fail? What percentage of value are you going to get back? You're not going to get 100% back. You're going to get 50% back, 30% back, 20% back, or nothing back. And I incorporate that into your value of equity by saying 30% of the time, the company is worth $10. The remaining 70% of the time, I'll get back only $3. My expected value then is 30% times 10 plus 70% times 3. So it's decision trees and statistics. I'm bringing in the likelihood of failure into the value. Most of your companies, because they're public companies, are not at the 70% failure rate. Thank God for that. Because if you put a 70% failure rate, you're going to knock off a big chunk of your value. You're probably looking at 15, 20, 25% failure rates. But that should be incorporated into your value. 
And it's not just young companies. I mean, somebody's valuing Boeing. I realized I was walking. Who's valuing Boeing? I ran into them in the elevator. No, there you go. No. In 2020, there was a talk, March of 2020, there was a talk that Boeing would not make it. Why it's a company with significant debt and it's one lawsuit away or one more accident away from God knows what. I would think that with the Boeing, you got to factor in a likelihood of failure. And there you have an advantage. You have a rating. You can use the rating to make that judgment. But I think it gives you more realistic estimates of value for companies if you bring that failure rating. I think, what do VCs do about this? they make up these target rates, right? 50, 60, 70%, hoping that it somehow incorporates failure rates. But it seems like a bludgeon. If you're gonna do this right, you have to separate out operating risk from failure risk. And that's what we're trying to do. And here's the update. And if you go, if you go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you can get the 2021 update, I think. They don't have the 2022 numbers. So they do this every year. You can keep track of what percentage of companies make it through your, your six, year seven. And you can see that in some sector, information, which is the, the, the name for technology, for every 100 companies that get started up, if you track them over time, only about 12 companies make it through your tech. A huge amount of failure, especially in the first 10 years. Now I'm going to tell you something that should make you feel a lot better. When you value companies, any companies, but especially with young companies, you're going to come with a value. You're going to look at that. How do I know I'm right? I'll save you the trouble. You're wrong. You're definitely wrong. You're probably hopelessly wrong. You're wrong 100% of the time, and it's okay. You say, how can it be okay? You don't have to be right to make money. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else, right? That's the thing you've got to remind yourself of. This is not about being right. It's about being less wrong. And on companies, which are young companies, where there's a lot of uncertainty, your chances of being less wrong than everybody else are actually greater than with mature companies because there's far more stuff that people don't dig into because they give up. So be glad that people give up on valuing young companies because it's our opening to, hey, I'm going to value young companies and potentially walk away with an advantage because most people are not even trying. So I get to the end of my, my Amazon webcast. My value is $35. The stock price is 84 And somebody in the audience asked me the question. Maybe it's, it's in here somewhere. Oh, right there. Somebody asked me, is it possible that Amazon is worth $84 per share? My answer was, a hey, possible is such a weak word. Of course it's possible. And I find this useful when I value companies. You might or might not. But I create a break-even chart. Remember, the three big assumptions here are revenue growth, margins, and sales cap. And revenue growth and margins are, in fact, the bigger assumptions. I create a table where I put revenue growth on one axis, margins on the other. So revenue growth on the left axis, the vertical axis, margins on the horizontal axis. My base case was about 32% growth and 10% margin, but I vary that number. What am I looking for? I'm looking for values that exceed $84 per share. See the yellow shaded boxes? So this company, or the, the case of Amazon, 2000, if they could grow at 50% a year, and have 14% margins, they'll be worth more than 84. If they can grow at 55% a year and have 10% margin, they're worth 80, 86. And if they can grow at 60% a year and have 8% margins. So is it possible that Amazon's worth 84? Absolutely. But investing is a game of odds. And I think if you go in with that expectation, the odds of you making money drop off because too much has to happen right for you to just break even. So now let me talk about follow-up. So I finished my 2000 valuation. I found the company to be massively overvalued, right? I said, I didn't sell short. And I gave you the little song and dance about why. One year later, AIMR, the parent organization of the CFO for whom I did the first webcast came back and said, would you be willing to do a second webcast on dot-com companies? But this time, the webcast is going to be, will any dot-com company ever be worth money again? Because remember, between 2000 and 2001, the dot-com boom bust. And people were saying, no, none of these companies is worth any money. So I said, okay. So in 2001, I revalued Amazon. And it was a very eventful year. 
You had the economy go into recession, the dot-com boom had bust, and the worries about capital being raised had increased. So my value went from $35 down to about $20 per share. I remember I finished the valuation and somebody in the audience said, aren't you uncomfortable that your value changed by this much in one year? And I said, after a year like last year, I'd be uncomfortable if my value did not change at least this much. And if you think I've changed my mind going from $35 to 20, how would you characterize what the market did? Because in that intervening period, the price went from $84 down to $11 per share. The stock went from being dramatically overvalued to significantly undervalued, and I was trapped. You know why, right? Because this time the question I was asked was, are you buying? And now I couldn't do the song and dance about Time Horizon. I bought Amazon for the first time at the, end, at the start of 2001. How long did I hold? I've been told, especially old-time value investors, what's the rule? Buy and hold for the rest. I never understood that. How can that be consistent with the value investing philosophy? Because if you buy when something is undervalued, what should you sell? When it's overvalued. Which is work, because it means that once you buy something, you got to re... Because you can't stay with the original valuation. So in 2002, I revalued the company. My value act was a good year. My value went up to... You know, uh, to about thirty dollars, and the stock price went up as well. But it was still undervalued. It stayed in my portfolio. Two thousand and three, my value went up significantly, but the price almost tripled. It was time for me to leave, so I left. I bought Amazon four times in the last twenty-one years. I've sold Amazon three times in the last twenty-one years, which should kind of tell you where I am with Amazon right now. Right. I bought Amazon for the most recent, most recently six months ago. But my point is, when you value something and you find it overvalued, don't give up on it. You've done the hard work. You've built up a valuation for the company. Revisit it. Maintenance valuations actually take about 20 minutes every year. Basically, you update the numbers. You, you revisit your story. The price is going to change. Your stock can go from being overvalued to undervalued over the course of a year. So never say never. I've heard investors say, I would never buy Snowflake. I would never buy Amazon. Because at the right price, you should be willing to buy if you truly believe in valuation. Finally, I did something that I usually don't do because it depresses me. I took my forecast from 2000. So this was in 2014. And compared them to the actual numbers that Amazon delivered. So there's my forecast. There are my actual numbers. Let's stop at 2010, which is my, I'd forecast revenues of 41 billion. They actually came in lower, but if you extend that, they grew for longer than I thought they would. So my revenue growth, I clearly underestimated how much they could grow. There are my margins. There are the actual margins. They are undershot in my margins. Whatever I learned about Amazon, I, I've, I've often called Amazon my field of dreams company. Any of you seen the movie Field of Dreams, Kevin Costner? If you haven't, you know, Kevin Costner builds a baseball field in the middle of nowhere. One of the I states in, must be Iowa. So, you know, no, there's a baseball field in the middle of cornfields. So he's built the field and this farmer who lives, what, 10, 10 miles down the road comes over and says, what are you doing building a baseball field in the middle of nowhere? One of the most famous lines of moviedom, what does Kevin Costner say? Do you remember? If we build it, they will come. That's the Amazon. Essentially, it captures how Amazon thinks about business. If we build it revenues, they will come. The profits will come. And in a sense, you could see this with Amazon. They went for revenue growth at the expense of margins. It's a perfectly viable strategy. But it's a, it's a lesson I learned. So when I valued Amazon in 2012, I factored that lesson. And this is a company that, can, that has patience built into its DNA and essentially will keep doing it. And the other thing I changed was I thought of Amazon as a retail company. I thought that's where they would end up and they would peak off at about 60, 70 billion revenues. But somewhere in 2010 and 2011, there was almost a rethink of Amazon and what they were as a company. In fact, in 2012, when I revalued Amazon, I called them a disruption platform because that's the way I think about Amazon. They're a company that targets any business that they think has fattened and goes after it. 
In fact, one of the most telling indications of how much Amazon gets into the minds of other companies is I remember a survey done of CEOs of the, top, the 50 largest companies in the world. And they were asked to list out five companies that they viewed as potential competitors. Okay. So let's start with Walmart. Do you think Amazon... Amazon lives in Walmart's head. I don't think there's a single decision that Walmart makes that doesn't factor in what Amazon would do. So do you think FedEx thinks about Amazon? The largest logistics company. But there were some surprises. JP Morgan Chase was asked to list five potential competitors. And you know who came up on the list of top five? Amazon. And there's a reason for that, right? Because Every disruption platform needs an army. And what's the army that Amazon has built up over the last 20 years? I remember this, right? The day they bought Whole Foods, I got an email from Amazon saying, would you be interested in frozen meals being delivered to you? And given, I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, if I want something delivered two days from now, it's Amazon and nothing. There's nobody else I would trust in the world. And I don't like my bankers. I have my account at J.P. Morgan Chase, and they piss me off to no end. I remember when I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast. I moved from a J.P. Morgan Chase branch here to a J.P. Morgan Chase branch there. And they charged me $45. I said, what the heck did you do? Take my money, convert it to cash, put it in the back of a mule, and send it across. You know, why $45? Because they can't. You know what should terrify J.P. Morgan Chase? That tomorrow Amazon sends me an email saying, we're starting Amazon Bank. Would you be interested? I'll be there in a second. Okay. So when you think about what Amazon has become, it's become a disruption platform. So my story for Amazon has shifted over time because the company's different. It's changed over time. So if you're, if you're interested, my most recent valuation, I think, was a year ago, February 2022. You can take a look at that valuation compared to my 2000 valuation. It is going to look really different, but it should because it reflects the changes in the company. Part. So there is my disruptive platform valuation. This was, uh, I don't know what, when I did this, probably in September of 2000. Date should be up there. But you can see that this is Amazon valued as a disruption platform. And the advantage of being a disruption platform is what's your potential market? It can be in any business you want. It can be immense. And that gets factored into the valuation. My advice for you is when you tell a story for a company, try to visualize what that story translates into with Amazon disruption platform. You know, when I think about Amazon, who comes to mind? Thanos from the Avengers, right? Because if you're in a business and if Amazon enters your business, that's like, you know, time, you know the click of the fingers that you turn to, to dust. When I think of Netflix, I think of a hamster on a wheel. Why? Because I, you think about that business. You got to keep producing 100 new shows every day to keep you kind of occupied. And that never ends. So try to visualize it because it'll give your story more meaning. And you can then think about what will this mean in terms of growth and margins and reinvestment as you go along. So we've talked about young growth companies and the challenges in learning young growth companies. You're saying, what about mature companies? Normally mature companies are easy to value because they have a long history and they keep doing what they're doing. But once in a while, a mature company stops and says, maybe we need to change the way we do things. Often because they get somebody from the outside pushing, Carl Icahn and Bill Ackman say, you need to be different. So let's assume you have a mature company that is in transition, that's changing the way it's doing business because the old ways are not working. And let's think about the challenges in valuing a company like that. So when you look at the existing numbers, you have a long history, but you know those numbers will look different if the company changes its business model. So here's how it'll look when you look at each question. When I ask you, what are your cash flows and existing assets? You can give me your history, but you're going to say, but that could change if we change our business. When I ask you, what's the value of growth? Again, you can give me history and say, but that could change if we change the way we run the company. With every question, you're going to get two different answers. One with the status quo and one if the companies run different. If you try to bring them into the same valuation, it's going to drive you crazy. So here's my advice. Value the company twice. Once with the status quo, the existing business model, 
And once with what you see as the new business model, you're going to get two different values. Then you got to estimate a likelihood that the company will actually change. That expected value is then going to become the value of the company. So rather than deal in abstractions, let me give you the example of a mature company, which is potentially going to change. You've got Hormel Foods. Never heard of it. It makes beans. But you know what its most famous product is? An odious, disgusting product called Spam. Spam is like ham that can last forever. Think about that for a moment. A meat that lasts forever, what you need to add to it. It was concocted by Hormel Foods in the 1940s when the U.S. Army was trying to get people back from Asia, back to the U.S. after the World War II. The problem is too long to fly. So what happened was you had all these soldiers loaded up from the Far East coming to the U.S. and they stopped in Hawaii. And Hawaii then is not like Hawaii today, no five-star hotels. There wasn't enough food to feel hundreds of thousands of hungry soldiers. You can say, ask me, coconuts wouldn't work. They needed meat. They were not vegans. So the U.S. Army put out a, requ a requisition of, a, any company can figure out a way to take meat and can it and make it last forever, we'll buy it. Hence was born spam. This is why if you go to Hawaii still, you get cookbooks built around spam. You can make anything with say kimchi spam, you know, kung pao chicken you know, becomes kung pao spam. And you throw spam, whatever it is, you replace it with spam. So Hormel Foods has been around a long time. And it's a company which actually is very conservative. Run. It's Pennsylvania based. It's a family control, it used to be a family control company. Now it's run by the traditional managers. And it's very conservative on many fronts. It doesn't borrow very much money. Why? Because the family never liked to borrow money. The company refused to borrow money. So the existing debt ratio reflects that Reflects that fact. I think their debt ra existing debt ratio is about 10%, 90% equity, even though they could afford to borrow money. They don't like to reinvest much. Why? Because they don't like to grow outside the U.S. They thought of the U.S. as their market. They said, we don't care about foreign sales anymore. So a conservatively run company doesn't reinvest much, doesn't use much debt. So my initial valuation reflects that reality. Because they don't reinvest much, their growth rate is low, 2.75%. Because they don't use much debt, their cost of capital stays higher than it should be. The value per share that I got for Hormel Foods run by the existing management is about $32 per share. And I'd have stopped there if that's what was I expected to happen in the long term. But Hormel Foods had been targeted by a couple of activist investors who were pushing it to be more aggressive on two fronts. One is they felt that the company could actually grow faster if it reinvested more, the higher reinvestment rate. The second is they felt the company could afford to borrow more money. So I increased the debt ratio to 40%. I'll talk about why it's the 40%. And I increased the reinvestment rate from, you know, from 19% down uh, up to 40%, which increases the growth rate. No, there was there to give up some returns, lower return projects, still higher than the cost of capital. So they're going to grow faster and have a lower cost of capital. That translates to the value of $38 per share. So value per share is $32. The existing management runs on $38 if they can change the way they run. As an investor, I have to decide which one I want to invest in. And I don't know which one's going to play out. So I wanted to attach a probability that change will come. So what, what, are you going to, what are some of the things you're going to look at to see if a company will change? You're going to look at the shareholder base to see who's the shareholder in the company. Are there big, you know, Carl Icahn on the list? There's likelihood of change goes up. The largest single shareholder in, the, in, Hor, in Hormel was, this, was a foundation called the Hormel Foundation. The family had set up a foundation for the shares. It owned about 26% of the shares. So I took a look at the Hormel Foundation. Maybe they'll be my ally in changing the company. You know who headed the Hormel Foundation? The CEO of Hormel. It's kind of reduces the chance of success here. So the chance I attached the, to change was about 10%. It's not zero because Hershey's had the same structure and change came there. 90% chance that they will not change. And my expected value is just 90% of $32 plus 10% of $38. 
$32.50. We'll come back to this issue later when we talk about acquisition and value of control. But essentially, when you have companies changing, you have to factor in what the effect of that change will be. Let me talk a little bit about a couple of issues, you know, especially on the debt ratio. I don't know how strong your corporate finance class was in what happens to your cost of capital when you change debt ratios, but I'm going to give you a very quick review of how to compute the optimal debt ratio for a company. So what you have here is the existing debt ratio for the company, 10.39%. I want to find out what the right mix of debt and equities for the company. And remember, my objective is to minimize my cost of capital. I want to get the lowest cost of capital I can. So I change the debt ratio from zero to 90%. I'm trying to factor in what will happen to my cost of equity and my cost of debt. As I go from zero to 90%, my beta goes up. Somebody remind me again, why is my beta going up? Am I coming up with these betas at the higher debt ratios? Unlever, relever. That's why we did the mechanism of unlevering and relevering. And the beta will go up because I have a levered beta. So my cost of equity goes up. To get my cost of debt, I estimated a rating for the company at every debt ratio. How do you think I did this? What did I do? You remember the synthetics rating, synthetic ratings process where I used the interest coverage ratio to come up with the rating? That's basically what I did. I computed the interest coverage ratio to each debt ratio. And as I borrow more money, guess what happens to the interest coverage ratio? It gets smaller because I have more interest expenses. My rate increases. As my rating decreases, I come up with the cost of debt at each debt ratio. Because remember, we get a default spread for each rating. There's my cost of debt. You adjust for the tax benefit. And at the very high debt ratios, I start losing tax benefit because I don't have enough income to cover the interest expense. There's my cost of capital. This is the right way to figure out what your right debt ratio is. You can't just keep the cost of equity and cost of debt fixed and just change the weights. That doesn't work. You've got to change both. And the net effect here is my optimal debt ratio is where my cost is between 30 and 40%. That's where I put Hormel is between 30 and 40%. So when you look at a company and you can take your company and you see an existing debt ratio, that's their existing debt ratio. You can always ask the question, what is the optimal debt ratio for my company? And figure out what that mix is and just check to see how much your value would be high if in fact you move to the optimal. Any questions on mature companies? Because some of you are valuing mature companies. I mean, for the moment, don't do anything crazy. Just value the company as is with the status quo. But leave open that question of what will the value of my company be if somebody else ran the company? The changes that came to the company. Which brings me to the final piece of this puzzle, valuing declining companies. Let's see what's difficult about valuation with declining companies. When I ask you, what are your cash flows from existing assets? And you give me your historical data. I'm going to see some depressing facts, right? Your revenues are probably going to be shrinking. Your margins are getting compressed because the company is not doing well. When you think about the value of growth, there's really no value for growth. It's really shrinking. You had to ask, how much will my value increase if I shrink in the right places? When I ask you, how risky are the cash flows, depending on what you're, what's happening to your business and what you're doing to pay down your debt, your business could be getting riskier or safer depending on what choices you make. Every question becomes difficult to answer. The same reasons young growth companies, it gets difficult because the company is changing. It's shrinking over time. So again, let me, let's talk about how to deal with declining companies. And I think the biggest problem is psychological. I often, when I run into people who value companies all the time, I ask them, when was the last time you valued a company with negative revenue growth? The answer is I've never done. But we know companies shrink. So the question is, how do you bring that in? And you've got to be realistic. You've got to bring in that drop in revenues you see over time and also bring in the fact that your margins could show, probably shrink. Even though you don't want to do it, it has to be realistic. So as an investor, you, you have to factor in the expected decline into the cash flows and see what the value of the company is. So here is my valuation of J.C. Penny, and I'm going to stop at this page because my allergies are going so crazy. I, I, I can't keep going for much longer. So if you look at my revenue growth rate, I've got a negative. And this is when J.C. Penny was viewed as a healthy company. You see negative growth rate at the top. So my revenues are shrinking over time. My margins, which start low, do improve. So I assume that they're going to be shutting down their 
these profitable stores first. So think of this as the most upbeat valuation I could think of for JCPenney, but it still looks like a horror story, right? Shrinking revenues, margins leveling off at a low level. But over time, I am saving this company by making its negative cash flows become positive cash flows. You just can't back at the cost of capital and you put in a likelihood that this could all go wrong because if you're shrinking and if you're not paying off debt, you could very quickly go into distress, 20% chance of failure. The value of equity that I get would reflect the fact that I see this company shrinking. And I, I think somewhere on my website, I have a valuation of Bed Bath & Beyond from a couple of months ago, right? And there's no happy end to the story. This is a horror story. The question is, how will the horror story end? And horror stories never end well. There's a chainsaw involved probably somewhere in the way and Bed Bath & Beyond, that might be the end game. So be realistic in forecasting what your company reven company's revenue growth will be. And if you have a company where you think revenue growth is going to be negative, don't have any qualms about putting a minus 5% growth rate. I know some of you are valuing cruise lines. I know at least a couple of people. And one of the issues with cruise line companies is will the revenues ever come back? Will people come back to cru cruises? Maybe they will, maybe they will not, but there is a very realistic chance that you're never going to see 2020, 2019 numbers ever again as a cruise line company. The good news is you don't have to buy another cruise ship ever again. The existing cruise ships are going to be over. Reinvestment is not going to be an issue. The bad news is you can't exactly sell off the cruise ships, right? Who's going to buy them? These are monstrous things that you can't fill in. Maybe you can sell them to somebody who wants to, I mean, I'm, I know there are at least a couple of cities that have used cruise ships to house the homeless. It's like an easy way of just getting extra rooms. Maybe that's the end game. As you liquidate, you make your company smaller, you sell the cruise ships off to anybody who can sell them. But if you have a company where the future looks bleak, then the best thing to do is be realistic and bring in the declining revenues and the shrinking margins into that business. I'm going to stop there. I just, as I said, my, my nose is running and I can't wipe my nose because I've got this stupid mic in front of me and I've got to get out of here. So I will see you on Wednesday and watch out for the uh, review session for the quiz. I will send it right after class today. So. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but Just email me. I can. I will email you the quiz. It has to be at the same time. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Perfect. So email me tomorrow and remind me, and I will set it up so that you will get it at three thirty on Monday. So wherever you are, make sure you're at some place where you can you can at least you don't need, so you just have to download the quiz, work on it, and at four oh five, and maybe four ten, email the quiz back. Okay, and if yeah. I work on it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I've actually had in the management like got some exchange. Uh, so uh, when uh, two firms management is exchanged statistically, do firms perform better or worse? Than... Statistically, they perform, perform better, but not all of them do. So it's not, so it, 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 statistics are based on an average or median firm. The median firm does perform better. It's nothing else because change usually comes to firms and the change is much needed. It takes a lot to change management. Only the very, very exceptionally bad firms see management change. You don't see it happen at average firms, right? So generally it's good, but there will be cases where people overreach and it doesn't work out. It always happens when like the main shareholder is changed or not. Not necessarily, not necessarily. It just might be a building up of bad feelings in existing shareholders who finally said, look, I'm tired of this and I need change. I mean, look at uh, Disney. It wasn't coming from below that you got Bob Iger come back to take over Bob Chapek. It came from the fact that they, you know, the company stock. Usually, one of the triggers for a management change is the stock prices drop fifty. That's one of the things. Mm -hmm. The second is these companies have had earnings issues, so it'll be a collection of things, operating and market driven, that lead to the change. 
but shareholders themselves might be just vehicles for that change. If your stock price drops, even shareholders who are happy with you two years ago are no longer happy with you. So it's not even a changing shareholder base, it's a shareholders with different views about the company. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Okay, I'm buying like probably phase 14 and just another. I'm wondering, are they buying the recreation? Probably. Entertainment, maybe? Not even recreation. No, put it in the entertainment. entertainment? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. I have a question. So, I'm doing my valuation on Zoom, that yes. shipping company, and I was wondering, I was trying to figure out what kind of different expectations they have. I was wondering if you had one you felt it worked best because they have really high revenues now because of the elevated shipping rates, and then the next year it's going to be like a drop off in, that, in those revenues. How about transportation? Transportation? Okay, that's not a question. Thank you. Hi. What's the coverage for the first time? It'll be everything from growth, right? We did covered all the way through cash flows. Yeah. Growth, terminal value, and new sets. So it's everything not covered in terminal value. Yeah. Um, and we can talk the lowest crystal. Mm -hmm. So can I talk final if it's my, my crystal is how No, final is not one of the options. It's always the questions that get dropped. Yeah. And remember, you because it always works forward, the final would never work anyway, right? Because it always, so it's on the rest, so, okay. Yeah. So I'm, I do have a question. I don't know if it's personal or it's changing. Yeah, yeah. But I expect you're gonna receive so many subsidies in the next next year. And do I in part for this? The question is, are they going to receive the subsidies or are their consumers going to receive the subsidies? The consumers, but I think also, like in, in Europe, they're yeah. going to be one of the stuff in Europe to subsidize these companies. So they have like, green and was, green bonds and low cost of debt and access to them. So to give them, so there are two they, things you can do, right? One is you can bring in the consumer side at high, to give them higher growth because they'll be able to you know, sell stuff that people are paying less for because of subsidies. On the cost of funding side, I would suggest keeping the cost of capital based on what they should be raising capital at and doing a valuation, mm -hmm. and then bringing in the subsidy effect by saying, because if subsidy is there, cost of capital is going to be 5% rather than 9%. That difference of 4% will translate into increase in subsidized value. That's like a 30% increase. The reason you want to keep it separate is the government can give subsidies, can take them away. So you want to make sure you're not building it in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's a subsidy, it's unlikely to be in the terminal value. It'll be in year one, year two, year three. But by the time you get to year 10, everybody's going to be in green energy. You're not going to be subsidized because of that. No? Okay. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, I have energy and we can figure out the solution, but my company's country of Manchester doesn't have the um, separation of percentage of revenues for like the different like, regions it covers. So we like determined that the main ones were the UK. And Manchester and United? Mm -hmm. Is it about merchandising on which because uh, their their revenues from the team itself are yeah. all so are the UK based, right? Yeah. So it's only merchandising revenues and they don't break down merchandising revenues. Mm -hmm. Just use the global equity basically. Okay, cool. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you.